Allegedly. Welcome back to This Week in Film. It's the weekly podcast where we get together and talk about the movies we've seen over the past seven days. Seven I'm days. I'm Nick Panuzzo's Like the Ring, a movie. I'm Nick Panuzzo, joined as always by Midwest Matt Lauer. Matt, how's it going? I feel like I, I forgot a line in there. <laughs> no, I think you could. I think it was the interruption threw you off. I'm doing all right. How are you, Nick? I'm doing just great. I just finished watching my second movie of the week. Ah, and I'm going to tell you what they were. I'm a movie that I just finished watching. The it's called it. No. It's called <laughs> The Terminator from 1984. Nice. Yeah. Did you follow and it up with Terminator 2? I started Terminator 2. Wait. I haven't. I didn't. I got about half an hour into it before I had to turn it off. Oh, I was gonna say to, to come talk to you. Okay. Uh, there just wouldn't be any other reason to turn off Terminator 2. Oh, yeah, you know, that. yeah, that's why. I watched the Terminator. Terminator, well, we'll talk about it. Yeah. The second okay. movie that I watched. Allegedly. Is a documentary, and uh, I guess we're going to get sued now, called Going Clear, Scientology and the Prison of Belief from 2015. Oh, we're going to get sued by Scientologists because we're going to say stuff about how it's allegedly shit. Those are things that you have said so far. Okay. What did you watch? I watched Jaws. Oh, no way. I almost watched Jaws. Oh. That's funny. Yeah. I was listening to a podcast and someone just mentioned it and they were like, yeah, you know, I really care about the characters. And I was like, you know what? That is dead on point. And I could really use a movie where I just feel really invested in the characters. I am watching Jaws. Mm hmm. Can't go wrong with Jaws 2. That is something that could be debated. <laughs> <laughs> I got a soft spot for Jaws 2 because that was the first Jaws movie that I saw. And I, it was right in my wheelhouse when I was like nine or 10 when I saw it. Uh huh. And I was like, this movie's great. This is the scariest, most exciting movie there ever was. Because I can only remember when Sheriff Brody's like smacking that electrical wire to get the shark to come over to him. Oh, yeah. And instead of saying, smile, you son of a bitch, he says, say, ah. <laughs> does he? He sure does. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was Jaws 2. Which uh, of the sequels, it's definitely the best of the sequels. And it's not great, but it's it's not terrible. Yeah, it's passable. Tell you what. It's definitely a good, just, it's a, a fun way to spend an hour and a half. Allegedly. Okay. So, going clear, Scientology and the Prison of Belief. As I said, from 2015, it is directed by Alex Gibney, who I found out is the same guy who directed that documentary you watched recently about the blood testing company. Oh, The Inventor. Yeah, that's it. And I guess this guy just makes documentaries for HBO because that's what this was. And basically, this tells two or three stories, really. One of them is allegedly the origin of the church of scientology and uh how l ron hubbard allegedly came up with all of it mm -hmm. and and then the other part of it is it's kind of real heavy on john travolta and then it's it talks a lot about david miscavige who is the current head allegedly of Scientology. Yeah, I, uh, I know I've heard his name, and I think I've heard it pronounced differently, but I, but I think it's pretty close. So Scientology is a it's a cult, allegedly, but it, it's legally it's a religion, and basically I don't even know where to begin. Like if you don't know what Scientology is, check out this documentary. They kind of explain it, but it's founded by L. Ron Hubbard, allegedly. Have you seen this? I've not seen the documentary. Okay. I've, I've listened to enough podcasts about Scientology to get background and stuff, and I think I might have heard it yeah. referenced here and there, but I have not watched the movie yet. So the movie is pretty good. You can definitely tell that lawyers were all over this, and reading the internet trivia from IMDb for it, it says that HBO had like some 150 lawyers or whatever working with the filmmakers just to make sure that everything they said was... I guess they couldn't get sued for. They're, they're sharing this all in the documentary? No, this was like post. Oh. This was in the trivia for the for the movie. Oh, oh right. uh, one of the produce One of the producers was saying this. So that gives you a, an idea of how... Allegedly. 
litigious the Scientology organization is. Mm -hmm. For instance, the IRS won't go after them again. They tried in the 80s or maybe the early 90s to go after them for allegedly violating all kinds of laws. And basically the Scientology organization sued the IRS into submission and the IRS just threw their hands up and said, whatever, and walked away from it. And there's your first clue that, hey, something, something's fishy here. Allegedly. The other clue is that L. Ron Hubbard is a science fiction writer <laughs> who's known for writing science fiction right. and widely known for saying the only way to get really rich is to start your own religion. And I don't have a problem with that. If you want to make up your own religion and tell people about it and people want to go, hey, I like that. That makes me feel better about things and it makes me want to be a better person. By all means, feel free. I, I have no I got no problem with that. So long as what you're doing isn't hurting someone else. And I feel like Scientology a twist here. Scientology allegedly hurts uh, lots of people. There it is. It's allegedly mean. It's really mean. So one thing that I noticed watching this is that I had never really seen footage of L. Ron Hubbard before. Like I'd seen pictures of him and, and all that, mm -hmm. but I had never seen like video of him talking or the way he like handles himself. And the first thing I thought of almost immediately was how Donald Trump is so similar to him, almost eerily so, where they have the same mannerisms. They both move their mouth the same way. The way that they present themselves is so i'm so sure about everything i'm saying that you must believe me and the people that allegedly fall for it fall for it and mm -hmm. and you, you can see how the cult of personality around donald trump beside the fact that he's wealthy and in a position of power now but like you can see how that personality that he has was able to attract so many people Mm -hmm. Because it's the exact same thing, uncannily so. Yeah, people are attracted to confidence. It's true. And if there's one thing that I can say about Donald Trump, whether it's earned or not, he is confident, or at least he fakes it really well. Mm -hmm. And like you said, people like that. And that's what this guy allegedly did too, is every time he spoke, he never says that he's wrong. Nothing he says is ever incorrect. Everything that happens was supposed to happen. You know, all that standard, almost cliched stuff. And he just slowly builds this religion from nothing. And the crux behind it is in order to advance in the religion... You have to allegedly pay money and the higher up you get in the religion, the more money you have to pay allegedly. And it becomes a one on top of the psychological torture they put you through allegedly, which is a whole other thing. They also will allegedly blackmail you <laughs> and all kinds of stuff because they have their version. Like, you know, Catholics have confession. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, they have that, and it's called auditing, right, right? where you hold on to those metal cans, and it reads the electrical signal in your body, and they allegedly pretend that it's because of aliens that live inside you, and that's fine. And that's they, your religion. They like basically I don't care. Like deconstruct you through this sort of interviewing session. Yes, but during this, you're being videotaped all the time, mm -hmm. and the person who is interviewing you is taking serious notes that they allegedly keep and that's kind of what they vaguely allude to with john travolta in this movie is the reason that john travolta is still a staunch scientologist is because they have allegedly he's confessed to everything that he doesn't want out in public allegedly so that's why he remains a Scientologist, but he's not like a Tom Cruise Scientologist, where John Travolta allegedly feels like he's in it because he likes the ideas of it, but he doesn't allegedly like the way they treat the people, but he's in too deep now to get out. Allegedly. Whereas Tom Cruise is, is more of a, I totally believe in everything about this. Allegedly. And it's creepy. I still like Tom Cruise movies, though. So if I, if I were to compare these people to politicians, you know, since you're making the comparison to Trump, I'd go, let's see, someone who's sort of believes some of the ideas and has kind of got his nuts in a vice might be like Ted Cruz. And then like the, I'm going to go all the way with this thing. It would probably be like Lindsey Graham. 
Yeah, I was going to say like a Lindsey Graham where it doesn't matter what I say. It's just the next thing I say is the the most important thing. Right. Yeah. And I'm just doesn't gonna, matter. I'm just going to not doesn't matter what I said. Uh, my tummy hurts, so I had to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Lindsey Graham's a piece of garbage. Oh, he's a piece of shit, yeah. So is Ted Cruz. That's true. And Ted Cruz more so. Like, at least Lindsey Graham's always been a piece of garbage, but he always seemed like he had integrity until he had to actually show it and then you're like oh okay this is all for show and then ted cruz is just this man has no spine insulted you to the nth degree and you're out defending him Uh uh-huh i don't feel like i ever heard trump say anything bad about lindsey graham don't think yeah maybe maybe in like primaries or something like that because i know lindsey graham was critical of him during primaries but then once he was the president yeah. he's like oh never mind i'll just bend over for you here right but like ted cruz i can't understand that guy and that's just the the seduction of power where it's just like i will do anything in order to maintain my position and it's just sad which ironically takes all the power from you but yeah but the paycheck keeps coming in so. allegedly <laughs> <laughs> Back to Scientology. Yeah, allegedly. It's a cult, and this movie kind of tells the story from the perspective of former Scientology members. Allegedly. Mm -hmm. One of them is producer Paul Haggis, who has done a bunch of shows. Like, I recognized his name, but I couldn't think of anything he did. And then they they mentioned some of it here and there, and I went, oh, okay, that guy. And then there's, like, a few other people. And one of the guys is the former spokesman for Scientology. And they have all this footage of him saying, Scientology is fine, it's terrific, it's great. Everything that you reporters are trying to say is a lie. And then it'll cut back to him in modern times going, yeah, I was just making shit up. (laughs) Where where I'm just like, I I don't know what to believe with you. I feel like you're just following whichever is more convenient for you. But I don't disagree with you right now. Anyway, so they've got that guy. There's a couple other people. And then there's this one woman whose name is Spanky, Spanky Taylor. And she's your real dive into John Travolta. Allegedly. Because when John Travolta allegedly joins Scientology, he was kind of already a star or something like that. He was a really fast rising star. And she got assigned to him to be like his handler with the organization. Allegedly. Mm -hmm. And they became allegedly very good friends. And at some point, so Scientology has allegedly a prison that they have called oh gosh i can't remember what it's called like the box or the room or something like that Uh but it's basically a work camp that people go to voluntarily of course allegedly and they go to be to be punished or for re-education it's a re-education camp allegedly and you work like 17 hour days and then you do hard labor for like four hours or something and then you get to sleep for an hour allegedly and they basically work the descent out of you. They, they so, kind of slave sh- you back into submission. Yeah. Allegedly. So John Travolta, there's this lady is in prison, Scientology prison for like a year or so. Allegedly. And Travolta is trying to get in touch with her and he can't get a hold of her. And then one day, whoever's running the organization comes up to this lady. Allegedly. I imagine it was in the 70s or in the 80s because they said, we would like to have a screening of Saturday Night Fever. Can you talk to John Travolta about getting us a a copy for our theater? And she was like, I haven't talked to him in over a year. And the first thing you want me to do is ask him a favor. And they're like, allegedly. Yeah, so do it. And so she does. And Travolta is allegedly incensed that he hasn't heard from her, but he allegedly agrees to to let her have the movie because it's it's before VHS. You know, like you can't just watch a movie back then. You had to get a reel to watch it. Uh He agrees to let them have or his personal copy of the movie if she will have lunch with him the next day. Allegedly. And she's like, yeah, that sounds great. We'll do that. So they get the movie. They watch it. Allegedly. And then the next day, she's getting ready to go to lunch with John Travolta. And the Scientology people say, We're, allegedly, you're not going anywhere. You're going back to work. You're going to the back in the, the hole. box. Yeah, get back in the hole. Oh, maybe that's what it's called. It might be called the hole. Allegedly. I don't know. I can't remember. And so then that was like, allegedly, the last time she talked to John Travolta. And apparently Travolta was allegedly 
pissed off about it because he knew that she wanted to meet with him and it, the Scientology people that allegedly wouldn't let her see him. It, you know what? I just looked into it. And by that, I mean, I Googled it. It, it is called the hole. Allegedly. The Hole is the unofficial nickname of a facility operated by the Church of Scientology. Okay, great. We solved the mystery, allegedly. Yeah. And so, apparently... Allegedly. Travolta wanted to leave the church, but the church said... Allegedly. We have all this information that you've given us. You're not going anywhere. Jeez. Because other, cause we're basically end your career. Allegedly. Now, the, the movie doesn't say that, but it implies it heavily allegedly and uh-huh. you could tell like the lawyers were all over every word to the point where it almost feels weirdly edited where they're chopping words out it feels like our podcast when, when we're <laughs> stuttering all over our words <laughs> and it's gonna feel a lot like this episode and, allegedly and so then travolta is like allegedly scientology good and then that's where they say that travolta allegedly like had his eyes open but didn't leave the organization because he didn't want it allegedly whatever he told them to come out in the public Mm -hmm. so that's kind of like an interesting story the one thing they do not get into in this movie is i was interested what what got me into it is i read something online of course and they were talking about david miscavige's wife who apparently has been missing for like 25 years allegedly and no one knows where she is allegedly but the people in the documentary say yeah she's in the prison she's not allowed out allegedly they don't go into that at all i was interested in hearing more about that because it's kind of a fascinating story but they don't go into that at all because probably for litigious reasons allegedly and also it was already two hours long i guess i don't really have too much more to say about it i could complain about sci- we could have our own complaint about scientology podcast but yeah i, mean, I don't want to i've uh i don't want to do that every time i've allegedly learned anything or listened to a podcast or had someone tell me about whatever experiences they have or whatever they know about it it's just the whole time each detail is allegedly just another disturbing detail yeah, it's fascinating, but at the same time, it's like... Allegedly. Ugh. If, if it weren't like a, happening to real people, allegedly, it would just be fascinating. But with it happening to real people, allegedly, it's, it's pretty disturbing. Yeah, I totally agree. Allegedly. agree with that statement. One of the things that they say early on, and I think it's Paul Haggis who's talking about it, is the booklet that they give you when you first join up... Allegedly. ...says, hey, everything that's in this book is bullshit it's all made up nothing of this is real but if it helps you then we're all on the same page because that's what we're here for and when you read that i I imagined reading that as someone who was looking for a higher power or some sort of spiritual belief or someone who is just in search of answers in this crazy mixed up world we live in and you know jesus just isn't good enough for you and so (laughs) i can imagine the the mindset of someone who allegedly willingly joins an organization like this where you go in you have allegedly these auditing sessions and when you leave everyone was pretty universal in there when you have these auditing sessions basically you just clear your conscience yeah and when you leave you feel you feel really good and sort of therapeutic in a way right which is funny because scientologists allegedly uh, hate hate therapists allegedly yeah, psychologists Doctor. are the devil. And and that's because at some point, allegedly, L. Ron Hubbard asked for help from the army because his brain doesn't allegedly work right. And the army needs to decline him. And so he said, allegedly, psych- psychologists are, or psychiatrists are all frauds. I'll make my own religion where we do what they do. And he, when he wrote Dianetic, allegedly, he submitted it to... You're talking about psychiatry, it's the American Psychiatric Association. If you're talking about psychology, it's the American Psycholo- Psychological Association. Right, the exact same thing. And so he, <laughs> he, he, he like sent them Dianetics and was like... Allegedly. This is what should be the new DSM. Let's go with that. Uh-huh. And the psychiatrists were like, "This? Are you out of your mind? No. What is this? What is this nonsense that you have sent to us?" And allegedly, he was really offended, which is really why they don't care for psychiatrists or psychology. In fact, allegedly, Christy Alley, a well-known 
psychologist never appeared on the show Frasier. I think she's the only person from Cheers to never appear on Frasier because Frasier is a psychologist. Wait, I'm pretty sure you just said that Kirstie Alley's a well-known psychiatrist or psychologist. I think you meant Scientologist. Yep, that's what I meant. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, okay, that's... Allegedly petty it's so mind-boggling but like you can understand someone who's joining something like this and how they can be allegedly swept up in it and then slowly it becomes your whole world Mm -hmm. where i know many people whose whole world revolves around their church Mm -hmm. and as i've said before i'm not a religious person and i can imagine that this is just as foreign to me if someone i know was is heavily involved in their church and then you allegedly threatened to take that away from them you're basically removing their entire community and the scientologist people are allegedly vindictive when you try to get out there is no out with them allegedly or there is no a partial way in like if you if you join and then leave they disavow you allegedly including your children allegedly will leave you behind like this one lady they interview hasn't spoken to her daughter in 10 years because she quit the church and the church was like allegedly you're done with your mom and she said okay Mm -hmm. it's the stuff like that where you're just like oh my god and on top of all that like when you try to leave allegedly especially if you say anything negative about the church which we haven't allegedly (laughs) and so they come after you allegedly like they declare you an enemy allegedly and They do everything they can to destroy you. Allegedly. So we got that to look forward to. Allegedly. (laughs) (laughs) So it's just, it's allegedly dangerous cult. And the reason that they haven't been stopped is because of money. Allegedly. That sounds about right. Allegedly. Lines up well with the things I've heard. They do say at one point, one of the people they interview says, if you were to take the FBI and break down the doors of the their prison, the people there would say, we want to be here. Allegedly. We're, mm. we're here by choice. There's another part where this one lady is talking about her child, and apparently children are a real burden to them. Allegedly. You're encouraged to not have children, and if you do have a child, the child... Allegedly. ...basically belongs to the church, and you have to give it up... Allegedly. ...to, like, their daycare... And this lady in the 80s had a baby. That one I've never heard. Yeah, this story's pretty messed up. Allegedly. So this lady had a baby and she gave it to their daycare. You could call it daycare, I guess. Allegedly. But it was, it's a, a nightmare of a place. Allegedly. And for whatever reason, she decided that she was... Allegedly done with the church and she was like i want to go see my baby and allegedly the people running the facility wouldn't let her in allegedly they're like no you're not allowed in here and so she said oh well the baby's got a doctor's appointment i gotta take her to the doctor and they're like oh oh, okay we'll go go get her and so she goes to get the baby and she says that the baby's in this allegedly soiled crib with a disgusting diaper covered in fruit flies and her eyes are swollen shut because she's just very sick allegedly so she picks up the baby and she goes to leave and this bodyguard allegedly comes out of nowhere and says where do you think you're going and she's like oh i gotta take the baby to the doctor and the guy says allegedly has this been cleared and she's like oh yeah it's been cleared and somehow she was able to make a phone call to a friend of hers that wasn't a scientologist and the friend rolls up and she sprints out of the building with the baby and allegedly all these people are chasing her did trying she, to get did her she get away with the baby back. she did get away oh, with the good. baby yeah but i can't imagine it's allegedly nuts like nuts this sounds like a, a hard documentary to watch it's very frustrating uh-huh. to watch it, it's it's frustrating and soul crushing at the same time where you're, you're just you can't believe that people are putting themselves through this allegedly but at the same time you can understand why but at the same time you're like you're so stupid allegedly <laughs> allegedly <laughs> and so i don't know i i imagine like with with any religion there's allegedly horribleness to it but with this one it just seems so allegedly out in the open about it i don't know as far as a documentary goes 
And this is the only part of the show that's going to make it through the edit. It's going to be Nick goes, I watched the documentary named blah, blah, blah. So tell us about Jaws, Matt. <laughs> yeah. As far as a docu, as far as like a film goes. Yeah. It's pretty compelling. You want to watch the whole thing. It's very long. Like it's just a shade under two hours and you're like, ugh, this is long. But there's a, a whole lot of story to tell. So you get it. The first half I think is better than the second half because they spend a lot of time on L. Ron Hubbard and he's kind of fascinating. Allegedly. As far as a con man goes. And that's pretty interesting. I learned a lot. Allegedly. Which is always fun to learn. And I got to use the word allegedly a lot. <laughs> so... Hey, Matt. Yeah. Tell us about Jaws. <laughs> okay, I can do that. So, Jaws, if you never heard about it, it's a little movie about a shark and some people. You know, I know Jaws sort of has, has this reputation for being like a favorite movie for dudes, which is fine. I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with being a, a popular movie for guys, but I think it's easy if, if you don't really appreciate appreciate or enjoy it, or if you've never seen it, I mean, it is true. There are people out there who've never seen Jaws. I think it's easy to assume that it's just a movie about a shark. And well, here's the overall plot. Nick, I know you've never seen it before. So mm -hmm. a guy who has recently become the chief of police in a small town, it's, it's an island town in New England, is... What time of year is this? It's summer. It's right before the 4th of July. And, oh, that uh, sounds like a really busy time for a beach town. Quite, quite busy. So busy that it takes care of the costs of pretty much everybody on the island makes the money they need to make for the rest of the year in the summer. Oh, boy. That sounds like a terrible situation to be in if there's some sort of horrible shark. Attack. Something goes wrong. Uh-huh. Yep. It's a shark. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, people start getting eaten. And Chief Brody has to do, Chief Martin Brody has to do something about it. And that's it. That's oh, the, how great would it be if his first name was Brody? Brody too. Brody? Yeah. We could call him Sheriff Bra Bra. <laughs> I, somehow I feel like the movie wouldn't quite be the same. Like in the moment where Richard Dreyfus goes, damn it, Martin. He'd be like, <laughs> damn it, Bra Bra. <laughs> now, I, I've loved this movie since I saw it as a kid. And I probably was, honestly, I was probably like four years old, first time I saw Jaws. And I just think that everything about it's perfect. The 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 music's great. The dialogue's great. The the acting is perfect for the dialogue. There are a lot of like little subtle things here and there and, and comments going on in the background or little short comments that someone will make kind of to themselves or as a really subtle joke to someone else. And, you know, it's directed by Steven Spielberg. So either he found just the perfect set of people or he was directing them perfectly or both because with maybe the exception of one or two barely on the screen at all, like just have a couple line characters where the delivery is a little funky. All the important lines are just done in the best way they possibly could. There's the, there's no line from Robert Shaw, Roy Scheider, Richard Dreyfus, or, oh, you know, I can't remember. Or the, the shark. Huh? Shark doesn't have any bad lines either. Or the shark <laughs> that aren't just perfect. There's no line where I'm like, oh, if he had just said it that way, it would have been a little bit better. It's, it's great. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge blockbuster movie that still seems intimate, you know, and it seems intimate the whole time. So these, these guys, so there's Chief Brody and then there's Matt Hooper, who's a oceanographer and there's Quint. And I don't even know what Quint's first or last name is. I, th I think Quint's his last name. His first name is also Quint. Oh yeah. Quee Quee. That's right. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and Quint's a shark hunter. And so for the last maybe third or half of the movie, they're out on the water hunting the shark down. Or is the shark hunting them? That's true too. But it's like, and correct me, well, don't correct me because it's an opinion thing. But if, if you if you disagree, jump in because I just feel like one of the greatest things about this movie is how intimate it feels. I feel like you get to see these great relationships with Brody and his family. But then with mm -hmm. each of these guys, you get a sense of like how Quint is haunted by some of the stuff in his past and kind of isolated. And you get a really good sense of why he just kind of looks down on everybody else and it's just like y'all don't know anything you've never seen anything you're you're not exposed and mm -hmm. then you also feel for matt hooper's character who like comes into 
to more or less bring all this expertise and knowledge and nobody seems to really take him seriously. Mm -hmm. Chief Brody's like, oh, thank God you're here because I'm in over my head, which he does a great job at portraying. But then they're, they're trying to advocate for like to do things about the shark based on everything that he's picking up from like looking at the remains of victims and stuff. And the, the powers that be are like, nah, that doesn't matter. <laughs> you just, you, what you've got to say is, uh, it's pretty void. And like at one one point, the mayor is like, yeah, you'd love to prove that this is a, a big shark because you get your picture on the National Geographic or something like that. And Matt Hooper mm -hmm. starts laughing because he's like obviously been on the cover of National Geographic a bunch of times. Anyway, but I, I feel like no matter who it is, even Chief Brody's wife, who isn't on screen nearly as much as everybody else, she's got these really great lines and you just feel like you know what it's like to be in their household. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, it's weird that it's like this action adventure movie that feels like probably to me, one of my favorite character driven movies. Yeah, totally. I, I can't even think of it uh, other than maybe some other Steven Spielberg movies. I can't think of other action adventure movies that have that where I, I feel like the mm -hmm. characters are a big part of it. And there's definitely no shark movie that's like that. No, every shark movie ever since this is chasing the Jaws dragon and it just they never do it right because you can't I don't think you can do this movie again like like this movie was a disaster as far as production mm -hmm. like the shark was supposed to be a huge part of it but it never worked mm -hmm. like the robot that they had just never worked yeah and so they just couldn't shoot it so there's nothing to show and that's one of the reasons why it's so good is because you never see it and then when you do see it you're like that thing looks dumb. See, but, you know, it's, but it's still effective. Like, you're like, this is fun. It's extremely effective. And, you know, I was I was watching it this time, thinking here and there about, like, how obviously this wouldn't be the same with CGI. But there's maybe actually, like, one or two scenes where I'm like, this shark doesn't... Not so much that it doesn't look real, because the whole time you can tell it's not a real living shark. But it, it's got personality and character, and it seems alive in that way. Mm -hmm. And... I think there's maybe one scene where it's swimming past the boat and you're like, okay, that just looks like it's moving on some sort of submarine or track or something. And then the moment where it kind of jumps out of the water onto the back of the boat, it's like, okay, that looks a little bit like claymation or something. Um, it roars. Yeah. No, no, that's, I don't think it roars in this one. It definitely roars a lot in the fourth one. Like oh, is that what I'm thinking freaking of? Freaking dinosaur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I, I, you know, jolly laugh. <laughs> some of what some of what is effective is because of the shark, you know, in terms of scenes with the shark in it. But the movie itself, I think one of the reasons no other shark movie has ever come anywhere close is they haven't taken the time or put any effort into kind of building the setting and having the characters be deep and interact in really meaningful or even like not very meaningful, but realistic ways. Like there are tons of mm -hmm. things in this movie that just do just little bits that that tell you stuff like in the very it's maybe not the first scene but very early on you, when you first meet chief brody i think it's he's at his house and he's like getting up and he and his wife are getting up getting ready to do the day or whatever and the phone rings and he picks up the wrong phone and there are two phones one's right on top of the other and one of them is obviously their personal phone and the other one is the sheriff phone and he picks up the wrong phone at first and it just tells you right there like, oh, he's not used to this yet. He doesn't, right. he's not used to getting calls at home. He's not really used to being the sheriff or the, the chief of police here yet. He, these things aren't something that he has down. And it's just tons and tons of little things and little bits of dialogue that put flesh to what's there even if you don't really notice them. You know, I didn't yeah. notice this until actually watching it the other night. Ben Gardner, the guy who owned the boat that the head comes out of when Matt Hooper's swimming around trying to f check out the hull of the boat and then like the head pops out. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Yeah. That guy is a guy that's in the movie earlier on who like when Matt Hooper first gets to the island, he likes help helps him up out of the boat and says like, well, welcome to the island, little guy or something like that. And I'm like, oh, man, I didn't even realize that was the same guy. And details in terms of conversation where people will say something in the background. Um, mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, no, this is totally it, it's not important dialogue for you to hear. But if you listen to it, it's it says stuff and it continues to set the context. Like there's a moment where they're on the beach and you're looking at Martin Brody watching the ocean, but his wife's in the background talking to 
some of their friends about what it's like to be an Islander, like someone that grew up there and whether or not she can ever really fit in. And Mm -hmm. there's just tons of that stuff. And you're not going to see that in any shark movie or action movie. I think the closest thing I come to that is like probably Jurassic Park. The first, yeah, you know Mm -hmm. what you're saying, like all the, there, there's very, there are no disposable moments in Jaws. Mm -hmm. All the characters, everything that they say, whether or not it advances the plot, Mm-hmm. It enriches it enriches the story, yeah, and it really you really dive into this world because uh, it's a horrible pun, but the Brody family is kind of a fish out of water in this situation where it's his first summer in Amity, right? Yeah, and the mayor Brody's like, "Hey, we got a shark problem." The mayor's like, "This is not the good, not a good time for a shark problem." So let's just kind of keep it quiet. And Brody's like, he wants to, he's playing the political game a little bit, but at the same time, that scene you're talking about at the beach where they do like the the dolly out with the zoom in while he's watching the kids in the water, and then he freaks out and starts yelling about the shark and and all that stuff. And you can just see like the weight of everything that's going on around him is is crushing. Yeah. And they build up to that so quickly. When you were saying about how when Richard Dreyfus shows up and he's like, "Cause I am in way over my head here," it's just like he is. He's 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 totally out of his depth. Another great pun. <laughs> and he's and he's just hanging on by the skin of his teeth. I couldn't think of another fishing pun there. Well, I mean, it's called but, jaws, and you just said teeth. Oh, there we go. And he's just he's just barely hanging on. And his authority is being questioned left and right. And so, like, when that woman whose son dies, Mrs. Um, Kittner. yeah, when she confronts him, that's a really powerful scene where she's just come from her son's funeral and she does the, you knew it was out there and you let my son go in the water and you did nothing. Yeah. And you feel for Brody in that moment because you're like, he wanted to do something, but his hands were tied. Yeah, he's trying so hard to do his best. He's trying to do the right thing for everybody Mm -hmm. instead of doing the right thing for everybody. (laughs) The, the, The issue is that it's like a modern day. It's like a real life problem where people won't like if an asteroid was going to hit the planet, they would. Well, that's not a good example. What's a good thing where people won't for instance, the climate was being destroyed. Right. Continue with your science fiction (laughs) fantasy. Well, see, that one's a little too real because it's happening, but it's too big and people can't wrap their minds around it because it's because it's winter right now and it's cold. It's cold. So that means it's not hot out. Well, I I think I think what you're getting is that that you don't know, right? That like if the shark never did attack anybody else, the best thing would have been to just leave the beaches open. Yes, that's what I'm getting at, where if he shut down the beaches before the second shark attack, he'd be a pariah. Well, and then even after... They probably would have run him out of town. Well, even after the second shark attack, he still can't get it closed. The second shark attack happens. That's the the Kintner kid. And... Uh um, they close oh, right, it down for 24 hours. He doesn't get the all clear from the mayor until the mayor's daughter almost gets eaten by the shark. Right. And yeah. then the mayor and then the mayor is like, please go get this shark because I have now been personally affected. Yeah. Yeah. So the, there's a girl that gets eaten at the beginning. He's like, hey, let's do something about it. The mayor's like, no. Then the Kintner kid gets eaten. And then he's like, okay, we'll shut it down for 24 hours. And then, yeah, then it eats this other guy, which is a great shot. This movie has some really great shots, which is no big surprise with, with old school um, Spielberg. But the one, it's one place where the shark looks, is super effective when uh, there's a guy on a boat and he's near Brody's son, who's also on a boat with some people. And he f- gets knocked off the boat by the shark and then as he's trying to climb up onto his boat again the shark is like swimming just below the surface with its mouth open to go at his legs and it's mm-hmm. just freaking amazing it's one of the best shots of like i think any movie in terms of just evoking such powerful feelings i can see why everyone's yeah. like scared of the water after that it's so good there's stuff like that in another movie you'd end up having it be about the politics or just about the shark and in this mm-hmm. movie it's like no 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 this is just this makes this seem more real cuz that's what a real context would look like it's the right amount right. of the politics for you to be in his shoes going like oh yeah here's this dilemma and right it's just more stress for him and yeah. and more that's making him feel like he's in over his head and brody's always like less informed than anybody else but more mm-hmm. engaged and more caring than anybody if right. it were if it were a hogwarts he'd be a hufflepuff 
<laughs> Your three main characters, we could say, are the Chief Brody, Richard Quint. Dreyfus, and Quint. Mm-hmm. And Chief Brody wants to make everybody happy. Richard Dreyfus just wants to get rid of the shark because it's a scientific miracle. And Quint wants to kill all sharks because he went down on the Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. And so he just hates all sharks. But all three characters have the same goal. This is another one of those movies where I've talked about it before, where everybody's on the same page. They just have different ways about getting to it. Yeah. And there's not like a part in this movie where where Richard Dreyfus goes, well, my secret poison is actually a tranquilizer and we're going to capture the shark in order to make clones for the army. <laughs> right. You know, like that's that's what happens in a Jurassic Park movie. And so <laughs> that never happens in this movie. Like Richard Dreyfus wants to kill the shark as much as anyone else because he knows how dangerous it is and it's killing people and he's the the conservationist oceanographer guy and even he is like this thing has got to go and when his character first shows up even you as the viewer are like oh who's this hippie guy because he's got a beard and his hair is long and he must be he must be here to save the planet and and he's got to like prove to everybody that he's like yeah i i care about the environment but i also like people (laughs) <laughs> and this thing is killing the things I like and it's got to go. And even with Quint, where where Quint is like, you're just some scientific mainlander. You don't know nothing about the sea. And Richard Dreyfus is very well experienced seafarer. And I just love their exchange, how they just slowly become the best of friends, like as at very, very gradually. But when it when it happens, it's like. That scene where they're they're comparing scars with each other, it's just so well executed that you just care about all the characters so and much so much like but once once you're done with the character, they're gone from the movie, like the wife the wife when when he says goodbye to the wife on the dock, we don't have a scene at the end of the movie where him and Hooper swim on shore, and she's still standing there waiting right. And and they hug and kiss, and that's how the movie ends. Like, the movie just ends with the two of them laughing about it being Thursday or Saturday, because they've been out for so long they don't even remember anymore. And, like, when the wife leaves the movie, she's she's gone. There's no, like, pining for his wife at home. Like, you can tell that he wants to be home, but they don't waste your time with the romance. It's just... But you, but you do get... Uh, and this isn't a disagreement with you. It's just like a, a nod or acknowledgement too to like her name's Ellen Brody. Uh, the actress is Lorraine Gary. You do get a sense of their relationship without needing to do anything that does feel unnecessary. It's just every right. time you do have that stuff, it doesn't feel unnecessary. It feels like you're getting more intimate stuff. It's like a voyeuristic, but in a, in a nice way that you get to yeah. hear things. And there's a line where Matt Hooper shows up to their house and he goes, I want to talk to your husband. And you could totally miss it. But she goes, yeah, so would I. And it's just right. like, oh, man, it tells you so much about how stressed he is and how much she sort of understands what's going on and right. feels for him. I, I love that. I love the relationship between yeah, the two of the them. The relationship between them, the two of them is just perfect. Where like that's an aspirational kind of relationship where like you watch that and you're like, this is a relationship I wish I had with someone. Right. Yeah. And, it's like relationship goals. Right. And you're just like, they're on the same page. They know what the other one is thinking. And this movie actually has my favorite touching moment of all time in it, which is there's, I think it's the scene, either Richard Dreyfus was there for dinner yeah. and he has just left or it's another scene, but like uh, Brody's got a glass of wine in front of him and he's got his hands in his head and you can just tell he's like just trying to figure out what to do. Like he's just kind of lost and he like lifts his head up for a second and just sees his son is doing the exact same thing as him from mm-hmm. across the table. And then Bro- there's like a little smile creeps across Brody's face and he likes to start to playing with the kid, like making faces at him. Yeah. And the kid plays back and then the wife stops, like stops for a moment and watches them. And it's such a quick scene, but mm-hmm. it's so telling about the characters. Yeah. It's a, an example of showing how much these characters care about each other without having to say, I love you. And I love it. Yeah. It's, it's, 
A great scene. I love that scene. I think it's just so wonderful, so well executed, so perfectly acted. Even from the like the kids' point of view, like the kids are barely in the movie, but you can tell they're a big part of his life. Oh yeah, yeah. And I don't even think that kid has really any other lines. But but you're right, and it, it, it doesn't feel like oh they just shoehorned in this scene with this kid. It, it feels like it totally belongs there. It, it fits in comfortably. Like every scene is like fits like an old shoe with the rest of the movie. And it, that's that section actually it's before Matt Hooper shows up. Then he shows up. There's that line where he's like, I'd like to talk to your husband. She's like, so would I. Then he sees him and he's like, so how's your day? <laughs> you know, like just obviously right. just like they totally get each other too. It's like everyone, it's the way you wish people would just interact with each other where they kind of are like, Hey, you know what? I know you're going through shit. I know, I know what your, your day must feel. However it is in your own world. Like Matt Hooper appreciates that Brody's living this whole life and he's there as sort of a visitor and he's like, yeah, how was your day? And then he starts drinking wine with him and then like even the end of that scene with the kid when they get done doing the face stuff and the joking around or whatever with this miming thing brody you know what he says to him at the end he's like now get out of here <laughs> right yeah he's like yeah he's like give me a kiss and and he's like why and i think he says because i need it and, oh uh, yeah and that's it like, yeah, yeah 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 now get yeah. out of here <laughs> you know? right which is what you say to your kids. Like, that's how you talk to them. Mm -hmm. It's very real. You play with your kids for like five minutes and then you're like, okay, go do something now because I'm busy. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, I got to go save the world, but thanks for the hug. Well, and then on the boat, they have all these like interactions too that are really, they just continue to fit. Like there's, there's this stuff going on and they have, and even the music, like there's, there's kind of horrific stuff going on and there's this adventurous music at the same time. And yeah. Like the sharks around and Matt Hooper's trying to get Chief Brody to go out to the end of the boat. And he's, come on, I need a picture. I need a, I need you there for scale. He's like, oh, I'm not going out there. Oh, no, no. It's like, right, he was yeah. just doing like heroic stuff. But he's like, oh, I'm still scared. I'm not, I'm not messing with this stuff. I'm just going to out a to picture. the edge of the boat. <laughs> yeah. And then by the end of the movie, he's climbing up the bird's nest with a rifle shooting stuff. So like it's, you see him get his sea legs around him. Well, and, and, and you still, or crow's nest, I but you, but you don't nest. see him being confident about it. It's just like, he has to do it. Cause right. He, cause he's well, a he wants to stay alive. Yeah. yeah. And even that stuff, like with the air tanks, this movie does such a good job of setting up the air tanks without telegraphing it. He's, it makes sense that if they got knocked over, the one guy might yell at the other guy. And then there's another scene where they start to move and Brody runs for them to like, make sure they don't fall out and get explode. Uh -huh. And even when they're first talking about the tanks, Quint's like, yeah, I don't know about you with all this equipment and stuff. I mean, what's it going to do with that thing? Eat it. And you're like, even seeing the movie a million times and knowing like, Oh, there's the line where he sets up shooting it in his mouth. I'm like, it still doesn't feel forced. Right. It's <laughs> yeah. The one complaint that I think I have about it yeah. is I just don't like the way the Richard Dreyfus ends up where he's in the cage and then he gets out and he just swims and hides under a rock until the shark explodes. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that doesn't work for me where he's just kind of like hiding and then he's like, oh, there's blood everywhere. I uh, figured I'd come up now. What's up? I, I actually made this note because I, I, I don't really mind it because I'm like, I would probably hide at the bottom of the ocean until I ran out of air. <laughs> but then if I saw that it was exploded and sinking to the bottom, I might go, oh, cool. I'm out of here. But right. I did want Matt to get to the surface and go, did you freaking blow it up? <laughs> yeah. How did you blow it did up? Did you explode <laughs> the shark? But even when he does get up there, he just goes, you know, Quint and Brody's like, no. Just, like oh uh, just like shakes his head yeah 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 and i mean i guess the last thing i'll say uh, actually there is one negative i have but the last thing i say before i get to that is that it's a freaking movie about a monster shark and it feels more real than most movies yeah that's that's a sign that you're doing everything right yeah what i don't care for though the other thing i don't care for is in the special edition of this movie when he blows up the shark Quint flies out over the shark's mouth yelling, What are you Wahoo? talking about? <laughs> <laughs> That's Jaws the Revenge. <laughs> oh, God damn it. Wahoo! <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that does happen in Jaws the Revenge, though. No, does it? Yeah. Mario Van Peebles gets eaten. And in one version of the movie, there were two versions. One was the theater version. One was the made for TV or the, the TV aired version. And in one of the versions, the top half of his body is swimming around. And he's like, hey, I'm still alive, man. And he's got this really Oh, terrible... right. And they pull him out of the water and he doesn't have legs. And then he's dead. I think you made right? up that part. No, no, he lives. What? Yeah. Oh, man. It's, it, <laughs> you and I should watch that movie sometime. It's an hour and a half that feels like four hours. Um, <laughs> it has one of those endings. I mean, in either case, whether he comes back to life or not, she kills it by running the boat into it. It uses the same footage of the half of the shark floating down to the bot or sinking down to the bottom as in the first movie. It's literally footage mm-hmm. from the first movie. And that favorite scene that you've got with the kid, they totally rip it off and it's done terribly. And it's just, it's, it uh, just spits on this movie. Oh, the NES game of jaws. I had the impossible Bro. NES game. Yes. And I was never able to beat that game, but that the NES game is based on jaws Four which I didn't put together till I was way too old. Uh-huh. And like, that's how you're supposed to kill the shark in the game is that like you, you flash like your light at it and it makes jaws roar and jump out of the water. And then you're supposed to, <laughs> you're supposed boat. to stab him with your boat. And I was never able to do it. And so in this modern age, like five or six years ago, I watched someone play jaws on YouTube to see them beat the game. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I was, and then when it was over, I was like, Oh, I was might, disappointed. <laughs> I might need to look that up. The I, shark just kind of like bleeds and falls to the bottom. Sounds about right. I, yeah. I remember the end of uh, Jurassic Park, the video game on Genesis, having like the shortest ending in the world. Was that the one with the Velociraptor on the bottom of the helicopter? Well, there are two versions because you can play the game as Alan Grant. And if you play that uh-huh. version, it ends with a Tyrannosaurus growling in the silhouette and if you play as a velociraptor when you finish at the end it's a yeah it's a little velociraptor in a box just shaking its arm back and forth right okay it's just a little shivering velociraptor the sega jurassic park game was awesome it was good i heard the super nes one was really weird Uh, it's really weird it's impossible the sega one was great yeah that was just a side scroller Mm -hmm. platformer Great, fantastic oh, great game. I'm gonna have to like download it. <laughs> I can't believe how much I love that Jurassic Park game. It was fun. Yeah, it was so good. All right, so the one, and I really looked for negative things. I really did. The only thing I could come up with is at the very beginning of the movie when the first girl gets attacked. The twilight. It's like morning twilight where it's a you know I guess the sun's about to come up. It mm-hmm. it's very. It is a weird time of day where it can seem like night and day, but it's like you've got moonlight and it really seems like night time and then they cut to the guy taking off his clothes and trying to get to the water and it looks like it's like 6 30 in the morning yeah and that kind of bugged me that's it that's yeah. all i got i totally uh i totally agree with that yeah that's it's it's very difficult to figure out what time it's supposed to be i, I imagine it was impossible to try to light for that yeah but they did not do a great job well they didn't all right it's it's okay when you're looking at the woman being attacked but mm-hmm. then it's like they cut back to that guy and I'm like, couldn't they have just shot this earlier? <laughs> you know, like when it's still darker mm-hmm. out, like I feel like the, the lighting with him would be the easy part, but I don't know. It does make sense though, that it would be twilight. Cause that's dawn and dusk or shark feeding times. Although the rest of the movie, they don't seem to really worry about that. I guess to close out your segment, a little fact about my family is my parents' first date was Jaws oh, in the awesome. theaters. Yeah, it's, it's a cool story. Have you ever seen Jaws in the theater yourself? I have not. Oh. Uh, have you done I, that? Yet? I hadn't. And then maybe like six or seven years ago, it was showing somewhere here. And I went and saw it and it showed in theaters every year after that so i've seen it in the theater like three or four times now and it's, it's oh, okay great. i was gonna i was about to rip on you for saying that you hadn't until you saw it and i was gonna say you could say that about any movie that's true but yeah jaws definitely see it and if you've seen it before and you remember it just as a shark movie really give it a second try thinking like like really pay attention to go into it looking for a movie about really good characters and i'll bet you have a even better experience, even though you probably loved it the first time. Mm -hmm. So what else did you see, Nick? I also saw a movie about an indestructible killing machine. I watched The Terminator from 1984, directed by James Cameron, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, Linda Hamilton, and Michael Bean. And this movie is 
awesome. <laughs> it's just great. It's the most disgusting 1984 I think has ever been. Like every everything about it is just so gross. Everything looks like it's covered in cigarette smoke and everything looks like it smells like that and vodka and the fashion is disgusting. The the hairstyles are disgusting. I think you're hitting all the reasons I only ever saw this once. It's I'm never I'm never in the mood for that dirty cigarette ashtray eighties feel. Oh gosh. It's like everyone is a chain smoker and it's just so grody sheriff grody (laughs) and and it's perfect it's so great the special effects it's again it's 1984 so you give it a lot of slack but they are out of this world great and effective and there's something that might might be obvious to everyone but i haven't seen this in a in quite a long time but when the terminator who is arnold schwarzenegger shows up he's got like long hair or shaggy-ish hair, and it's Arnold, but he looks like a little boy, kind of inside this uh, inside this giant man body, where he's just got like this little boy's haircut, and uh, I don't know how else to describe it, but so he gets into a firefight with Michael Bean, and Michael Bean blows up a car, and the Terminator runs through the fire, and I never realized it before. But the fire burns his hair off and gives him his trademark spiky hair and burns all of the hair off of his face. Oh, that's why. He so he's got eyebrows no eyebrows. Yeah, that's why that. he looks so weird. OK. And I never put that together. And I was like, oh, OK. Why didn't it burn? That the makes sense. What, like, <laughs> that doesn't make sense. He even lost his eye- eyebrows, but he still has an inch or two of hair. Yeah. I mean, his hair gets real sh- like pretty short, like 80s. As short as your hair was allowed to be in the 80s. Right. And his hair is just like that that's short hair. And I feel like the reason that they did that is because later in the movie when he has to like perform surgery on his eye uh-huh. or whatever and cut like the skin off of his face. It's so that on the prosthetic head, they wouldn't have to put fake eyebrows on it where if you can make the real life Arnold look as unnatural as possible. When you look at the prosthetic head, it's not quite as dramatic as a shift. It's not as jarring. I mean, it still looks like a robotic head. Like you're like, you're not fooling anybody, but it's, but there's sometimes where you're looking at actual Arnold and you're like, is that the prosthetic head or is that a real person? And you're like, oh, that's, that was a really great decision because the eyebrows are the, the look on his face is just so distracting that it prevents you from really taking in what's, what's going on. And there's another part later that I never caught where the Terminator is back in his hotel room or whatever. And there's the sounds of flies buzzing around. Uh, My wife and I were watching it and I said, oh, his skin is rotting because it's been exposed for like a couple of days now. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's just rotting and there are like flies around and he's got like all this bloody mess in the hotel room for when he had to clean himself up. And I was just like, oh, that's just like a really nice touch that brings like a level of authenticity to it that the modern Terminator movies is sorely lacking. Mm-hmm. And then there's a, another moment where Michael Bean and Linda Hamilton are in this big car chase with the Terminator and Michael Bean shoots the Terminator in the eye with his gun, like unintentionally, he's just shooting at him and he hits him in the eye. And then the Terminator crashes into a wall and the cops show up. And this is when Michael Bean and Linda Hamilton get arrested. And then they get taken to the police station for, for later. And they get out of the car. Michael Bean looks at the car with a Terminator in it and the Terminator's gone. And I thought for a moment, why is the Terminator not just killing everyone here to get to Sarah Connor? And what you realize is that, oh, he's damaged. He's got to go fix himself before he can get back to killing again. And it's just like this neat little touch that one allows the movie to continue because otherwise the movie would be over in this scene. But two, it allows for like the the robot character to develop a little bit where okay, he doesn't really have a character, but when it allows for that scene for where he cuts his face open and he cuts his arm open and you see all his mechanical parts and things like that. And it's just little things like that. You're just blown away by how well it's executed. And I love it. 
It's it's great. It's like I said, it's been a long time since I've seen it, so a lot of it was very fresh, but I knew all of it was was coming. Like there's nothing about it that's a surprise. But Michael Bean's great in this movie. Linda Hamilton Linda Hamilton's okay. She's way better in Terminator Two. Uh, in this movie, she's she's just like a damsel in distress the whole time. Yeah, whereas the in Terminator Two, have she's as much to show. Yeah, it's just just really well done. Just a really well done movie. The sequences where we're in the future uh, with Michael Bean fighting the term the robot army in the future are really well done as and it's just so well done if you haven't seen the first terminator in a long time strap yourself in to go back to 1984 and <laughs> want to take a shower after you're done watching it but it's it's a fun ride like i loved it the music is perfect for what it is it's an 80s movie through and through it looks very inexpensive but expensive at the same time if that makes sense you can tell it was made for as little as they could spend on it and they'd stretch the budget as far as it'll go where uh stan winston the the horror Mm -hmm. or the special effects guy did all the did most of the terminator special effects stuff and they it looks out of this world great the only stuff that looks real bad is and even though it looks bad i'm like this is kick-ass is when the terminator is the arnold skin has melted off the terminator after another fire and it's just the robot skeleton like chasing Sarah Connor and or Sarah Connor and, and Kyle Reese. And it's just this claymation robot walking down a hallway and it looks it looks terrible. But the weight of the special effect, because it's real, mm-hmm. carries so well. Like even though you can tell, oh, this is this is superimposed on this hallway, the camera is moving down the hallway, but the camera is also moving with the Terminator. So it just looks fantastic and even though the special effect fails with compared to today's standards it has this weight to it that even in the future scenes where you're seeing future airplanes and future tanks well like that terminator movie i watched last week oh right i have a make sure we go to corrections corner Right. After I finish my thought, everything that they would do today, it would all just be CGI and in the background and it would just look so bland and boring. Whereas this stuff, everything looks used and and heavy and dirty like it's been in a war. And in this new Terminator movie, like I was saying last week, when the Terminator's walking out of the water, the water doesn't even ripple right. around it. Like that's how lazy it gets with it. Where yeah, it'd just, be better just, to have a something that's not moving so fluidly, but actually is interacting with the water and you can go, hey, that seems like it's there. Even if yeah. it's not perfect looking aesthetically. That's really all I got about the Terminator. I don't really have too much to add that thousand people haven't said a thousand times before. But Correction uh, Corner. Corrections Corner. Last week during Terminator Dark Fate, I said that the beginning of that movie takes place in nineteen eighty eight before the events of Terminator Two. Uh-huh. I was wrong. I went back and checked and it takes place in nineteen 19- 98. So I'm just blind. But it's three years later from the events of Terminator 2 because while watching Terminator 2 today, the beginning of it, the T-1000 looks up John Connor's information on the computer Mm -hmm. and he was born in 1985 and it says he's 10 years old. What? So Terminator Terminator 2 takes place in 1995. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Mm -hmm. You're telling me that in Terminator 2, he's supposed to be 10? Right? He's supposed to be 10. That's ridiculous. That's, they didn't think about what they were doing when they put up that computer <laughs> screen. That's, that's not right at all. Yeah, he's he's supposed to be 10. It's It literally says he's 10 years old and he was born in 85. It takes place three years in the future from when it released, but two years before Judgment Day is supposed to happen. So in Terminator Dark Fate, right, yeah, cause, when... Because Judgment Day is supposed to be 1997. Right. So in Dark Fate, I, when... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time getting over this. It's just so, that. It's what a huge, what a huge stupid flaw. Ten. Well, I mean, like at the time, at the time, I think Edward Furlong, or as I like to call him, Eddie, is he's like 13 when they're filming it, so he doesn't look. And he looks he like looks he's supposed older. to be somewhere between 13 and 15. So I guess 14. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't disagree with that, but he's supposed to be 10. He's supposed to be 10 years old. Uh, uh. All right. Yeah. Sorry, you were going to try to say something else, but I couldn't help it. Oh, I was just tying it into the Dark Fate movie where that movie, it's just three years later. 
and then they're just on vacation. Oh wait, no, so. he was uh, he was born in nineteen seventy, August second, nineteen seventy seven. So in ninety two, he was fifteen. Okay. Yeah. Well, that would explain the. Well, I guess that would explain all the voice cracking stuff. But yeah, he's ten, he's a little baby in this movie. So stay stand by for more information about Terminator Two in a future episode as my voice cracks too. <laughs> All right. Well, that brings us to everyone's favorite moment of the show, our movie rankings list. Now, I'm very excited to hear where Jaws is going to go on your movie ranking list. Is it going to crack the top two? Take a guess. You love L.A. Confidential so much. True, it's Jaws. <laughs> Jaws, Jaws is, is number your one. new number one. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Wow. I thought you were going to go with L.A. Confidential for it. I, I and put Jaws at number two. I I can't. I I love Ellie Confidential and I like some of the characters, but I I am I don't love the characters the way I do with Jaws. Mm -hmm. Like I yeah, like I want to be part of the family or the people on the boat in Jaws. Ellie Confidential. I'm like I'm just happy watching these guys do this stuff. I kind of like uh, you know if if I were to meet Guy Pierce's character. I'd be like, hey, you know what? Good job being a good guy. But Jaws, I'm like, I, I want to walk into this movie and be there. Good job being a good guy. You're still a dick. <laughs> <laughs> There's truth to that. Wow. New number one. Yeah. Five well, that five. hasn't that hasn't happened since week 98 or 94. I think that's the first week <laughs> <laughs> or the second week. So we, uh, yeah, we I started assume, at, I we started five. the hierarchy list, and I just put a movie right at the top right away. <laughs> well, I guess it had to be, but it just stayed there. Yeah, it had to be, yeah. I think the first movie on your list was As Above, So Below, honestly, because I remember making the joke, the greatest movie of all time. Yeah, week 91, As Above, So Below. I made the joke, As Above, So Below is the greatest movie of all time, according to you. Uh, that sounds right. Yeah, it was. that's a fun movie. That was it's no Jaws. No. <laughs> five stars, recommend. Okay, great. Now, yeah, for me, uh -huh. let me start with the Scientology movie that we allegedly talked about. I'm going to put this in my number 40 spot underneath Iron Man 3, which should be much higher. I hate my placing of Iron Man 3. Iron Man 3 must have been what I watched the first week of this show because it's in the number. It's from week 91. I haven't seen it, but... Um, seems like you should it watch it it's lower. good <laughs> and i'm gonna give the going clear movie three and a half stars i did quite enjoy it i, I don't want ever want to see it again but i would recommend if you're interested in learning more allegedly about something sketchy check it out let me ask allegedly. you allegedly i know you already allegedly reviewed it but mm -hmm. i know you said it felt like it was a bit long did it feel like it wasn't really moving at some points at some points, it does feel like it's not really moving, where you just kind of feel stuck in place. Like they could have edited out a couple parts or something. Yeah, like they're just kind of rehashing some stuff, but I don't fault them for it. They're just telling a story that's there. Yeah. I, I remember uh -huh. feeling that way a little bit with The Inventor. That's why I was wondering, like, maybe that's mm. some of the feel of that guy's documentaries. The guy who directed it, the Alex Gibney guy, he also directed another documentary that i had seen oh he directed that enron uh the smartest guys in the room documentary oh okay and that movie's excellent you should check that out okay and if you if you haven't seen that that's excellent I, I and it's but it's about interested in it. it's about the whole enron thing and it's it's kind of old now but i didn't watch it for a very long time because i thought it would be dated and it really holds up, especially in today's in today's environment. Well, I was going to say, even with you saying it's old now, I'm like, yeah, until the same thing happens again with some other industry or the same one. And we're going, oh, it's exactly the same. Exactly. Yeah. It says Just the smartest out, guys check in out the room. Both of those. Uh, it's called Enron, the smartest guys in the room. Okay. But it's uh, directed by the same guy. Yeah. And he's made uh, quite a few movies. But I think those are the only that I have seen. Now, yeah. where to put the Terminator? Hmm. Because the, the problem with this is that I'm in the middle of watching Terminator 2 and you can't judge one without judging the other and yet I must I think you could do Terminator 2 on its own but I don't think you can do Terminator without Terminator 2's influence see I disagree I think both movies can exist all on their own they don't need each other they complement each other very well and for that I am going to give the Terminator the number 5 spot above the Martian but below Master and Commander and I'm going to give it four and a half. <laughs> hey, wait. Four and where, a half. Where is that stars. in comparison to um, to Predator? 
Predator is in the number 13 spot. I also watched that on week 91 when I watched Iron Man 3. <laughs> That's funny. I definitely check it out. Four and a half stars. How do I feel about that? I feel pretty good about that. I don't think it's a five star movie, but it's very close. But I feel like I'm saying it's four and a half because I like Terminator 2 more and I'm going to make that a five star movie. But of course, I would never judge a movie before I've seen it. Me neither. Uh, except for that Iron Man 3. You should watch it. It's good. <laughs> but make sure you watch it like a hundred times so you can really take it in all the, <laughs> the subtle <laughs> elements of it. <laughs> Just, you know, let it burrow under your skin like some sort of parasite. It's very good. Matt, anything from Midwest Matt recommends this uh, week? Yeah, actually, I guess it's a little contingent on your conversation, but actually first watch Get Out, Nick. But other than that, <laughs> the, there are podcasts that if you are interested in getting some information about like the, the story of... Um, Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard. Behind the Bastards does a couple episodes. I, I think it's either either two or three parts on L. Ron Hubbard. In fact, I think they might do two different series. One that's his fuller story and then one that's like just like specifically the last couple of years of his life. Mm -hmm. And then there's a podcast called Oh No, Ross and Carrie, which I haven't heard in a while, but I used to listen to and I know that they had a pretty good series. It might have been five episodes or so where the guy kind of went undercover into Scientology settings and he got caught a lot, but, but it's pretty interesting and he's kind of able to illustrate some of the the protectiveness that there is there and this sort of sense of like if you watch uh, oh, what's the movie uh, or the show uh, Chernobyl and there are some scenes where like KGB people are following folks around it's a little bit like that sort of feel where it's like they have their eyes on you get out get out mm -hmm. run so right. oh no right. Ross and Carrie and behind the bastards and if this episode sounds really weird compared to other ones it's because we didn't want to get sued yep our lawyer who will remain nameless did not want to take the case <laughs> so <laughs> So, so we did the editing ourselves, meaning Nick did. If you want to send us an email and tell us what you saw in movies this week, send it to us at thisweekinfilmpodcast at gmail.com. Got it right the first time that time. Good. Or contact us on almost all of the social medias and reach out. Well, I guess if that is the end of the reel, Matt, we'll see you next week in film. And remember, judge politicians, not people. They're the worst. Yep. See ya. Allegedly. <laughs> <laughs>